It's been a bit of a turbulent time for Payday as of late to say the least. Between the unveiling of Payday 3's gameplay, or at least parts of how it's likely to unfold, on top of the sheer chaos that the epic merger with Payday 2 has caused, it's certainly been eventful, one way or another. But Payday 3 is the big one, and with it being three months away by now, it's time to start preparing for the move towards it. And I might as well do so by training my heisting prowess physically in another Smash Bros styled crime spree run for Payday 2. Previously, we've utilised medieval tools of warfare and tried out weapons from essentially before time began, and this challenge is effectively the logical conclusion of where we've been progressing with this lot. We are advancing here to a purest melee setup. Yes, here we'll be tackling the mode as the bruiser from the Bronx of Punch-Out, Little Mac. As always, there are rules and guidelines to run through as we tackle the crime spree circuit, so we might as well go into them. As ever, the objective is to get as far as possible in Crime Spree using the Little Mac build. We are only allowed to utilize weapons that either the character uses in Smash or within the walls of their home series, with nothing else allowed. However, things start to deviate a bit here compared to the last two. In this one, I'm taking a monumental risk and say that AI crewmates will not be allowed for this run. To make up for this, however, healing items and jokered cops will still be on the table, because this run would be nigh impossible otherwise for reasons I'll go into later. We'll also be adding a new rule, as you may have noticed from my gameplay, that aside from the use of vanilla HUD, mods will be kept to an absolute minimum. After that, it's standard fare again, we can only re-roll once per mission select if we need to. And as for the norm, we are only allowed three failures. Once the third stock's used up, the crime spree ends. Anyway, it's time to crack on with things and begin training for the biggest brawl that we've ever had to deal with before. Yes, our outfit is not WVBA legal, but it's about as close as we can get to regulation material. But that's not the core of our build. If you watch the Simon Belmont build, then you might understand where our weapon focus will be as we'll be taking a similar approach. We'll start with secondaries this time, and like the Belmont build, we'll be using the pistol crossbow, using explosive bolts, a barrel mod, and the camo grip. You can use a concealment boost if you need it too. This weapon is crucial, as it's the only secondary in the game with both good concealment stats and a non-renewable ammo source. It'll also alleviate the threat of tasers and prevent us from breaking our own rules. The primary weapon, therefore, isn't of much consequence, so you can roll with whatever you wish, seeing as how you won't actually be using it. However, I would recommend weapons that can be modded to be as concealed as possible, as we'll need it to be concealed as much as we can for our skill set. Generally, as long as you can reach the high 20s or even 30, you'll be set. The same can be said of throwables, but you'll want to use something that can just be thrown away and won't have a likelihood of killing by accident, so in this case I went with the throwing axes. Our melee weapon, and the only legal weapon we'll be allowed to use in this run, is of course the overkill boxing gloves. Because what is a boxer without his padded fists? While we won't be pulling an Aaron Ryan and load horseshoes into them, we'll be utilising skills to make it hurt for the cops just as much when we punch them. Our equipment will be the first aid kits to make sure we stay topped up during the fight. Question the legality of healing mid-fight all you want, but if the likes of Soda Popinski can do it with modified bottles of soda, then frankly so can we. Our armor will be the two-piece suit, and likewise our perk deck will be the sociopath perk deck. This is definitely not the best way to use the perk deck at all, but being fragile is a part of being Little Mac. Our skills are a bit all over the place, as our main focus will be on three aspects. Healing, Jokers, and the ability to punch whatever we can interact with. In Mastermind, I picked up Combat Medic as well as Quick Fix Basic and Uppers Aced in the Medic branch, and Forced Friendship Basic as well as Joker and Partners in Crime Aced in the Controller branch. Alongside First Aid Kit skills, we will be permitted the use of one Jokered Cop at a time, as they will act as our trainer. Our Doc Lewis, so to speak. In Enforcer, I picked up Underdog Basic in the Shotgunner branch, and Resilience Aced into Transporter and Die Hard Basic before picking up Shock and Awe Aced in the Tank branch. 
We'll need all the help we can get with bags and on top of better armor recovery, we can also use our punches to stagger shields. A very useful thing to have. In Technician, I picked up Hardware Expert Basic as well as Drill Sergeant and Kickstarter Ace in the Breacher Branch. It seems odd, but tapping into Kickstarter Ace makes sense for a build like this. If we're only really allowed to punch things, it makes sense that we'd be allowed to punch the drill too. And trust me, this will cut down on a lot of time and stress when we need it most. In Ghost, I picked up Chameleon Basic in the Shinobi Branch, Duck and Cover Aced into Parkour and Inner Pockets Basic before picking up Shockproof Aced in the Artful Dodger Branch, and Second Wind and Optical Illusions Basic as well as Low Blow Aced in the Silent Killer Branch. In addition to crits, we'll be adding an element of mercy for ourselves in Shockproof, which will hopefully allow us to mitigate the impact that tasers will have on us. And in Fugitive, I picked up 9 lives and up you go basic as well as Feign Death Aced in the Revenant branch, and Martial Arts and Pumping Iron Aced as well as Berserker and Counter Strike basic in the Brawler branch. Feign Death will essentially be our 45% chance for a lifeline in any given situation that we go down. Otherwise, if we run out of health, we're essentially out for the count. In addition, we need our boxing gloves to be as good as possible, hence why I went all in as much as I could. I didn't opt for Counter-Strike Aced in this one, however, because Cloakers won't charge at you and take you down instantly if you're playing alone. Joker Cops won't change that either. So there we have it. Our build is in place. It's been upwards of 14 years since the last Punch-Out game, and frankly, Little Max Timeout is not paying any bills anytime soon. If fighting for dirty money is how Mac has to get by until his return to the spotlight, then so be it. With our boxing gloves donned and ready, it's always the age-old question of just where to begin the crime spree run. An interesting set of choices led us to the first major heist, the car shop. Even as a solo act, this would be a relatively simple job to punch our way through, even if we're forced to hold these weird gun things, which Mac has no idea how to operate with boxing gloves on. Even still, making my way in via the rooftop, I subdued the manager and the perpetually arguing couple, and got the hack started. I then decided to take my frustration out on some bottled water, before making my way to the van, setting up the C4, and driving off with a nice red Falco Genie. More impressive still is Mac's ability to drive with boxing gloves on, more than making up for the fact that this was done with no bloodshed, but there'd always be a chance to punch people's faces in later. With the next few choices feeling next to impossible, a re-roll was needed, and that sent me to the much more manageable bank heist. With the vaults in the front, I decided not to bother with subtlety and just got in with my dukes up. We even got our first Doc Lewis, who seemed to have lost a lot of weight over the years. The loud version of this heist definitely serves as a good indication for sociopaths' functionality with boxing gloves. Even though it's not the most optimal setup, the gloves swing fast enough that it can benefit from the perk dex damage boosters. On top of that, we can get health and armor from kills at a fairly rapid rate and can inflict panic every once in a while. So this is our source of health regen. As long as I can get kills with consistency, I can top back up in the middle of a fight without the need of a first aid kit. The heist was fairly routine in the end, nothing really worth riding home about. Onwards and upwards to First World Bank, which I would aim to do stealthily as much as possible, if only to avoid snipers. Which is this build's kryptonite being the only enemy I can't reach. The manager was found pretty quickly, and I was able to find the code for the vault easily enough, proving that Little Mac can indeed type with boxing gloves on. After that, it was a case of systematically clearing out the vault area with little trouble and getting the money secured though not before punching two more beat cops in the neighbouring office building and giving the workers there quite a surprise. Next up, the search. The first job in this heist would be to joke at the first FBI agent I came across as the heist begins. And for good reason. These guys are disgustingly overpowered. So, having one as my personal trainer will be invaluable for a heist like this. Keep an eye on his kill counter next to his health circle as this progresses. Either way, I searched the archives for several years, got access to the FBI director's computer, and brought some encryption keys, all while punching my way through everything that moved. After this guy definitely broke boxing regulation by bringing a taser into the ring, I got the master server and slogged my way to the escape, with an impressive number of knocked out cops in my wake. 
The next destination was Swing Vote, the standard day two of election day. Again, I'd want to stealth this as much as I could be able to, but after four machines, I was struggling to find the last two I needed and was inevitably caught short after this guard was caught in Thor K being made to prostrate himself before me. What followed was a struggle for the remaining two hacks to finish before doing the single most tedious task in the entire game. A near seven minute waiting game to get the security footage. Hopefully Payday 3's objective timers are nowhere near this egregious. Towards the end, this bulldozer brought me down, but Fane Death kicked in to save the run from an early stock failure, and it was the adrenaline of being self-revived as well as a lot of first aid kits that inspired me to run through sniper and turret fire to the van. A hard fought win, just how we like them. Funnily enough, the game decided to reward me by giving me a second crack of the whip at this heist. Annoyingly, it went the same as the first. I could find four machines easily enough, but the last two were eluding me. I should also take this time to point out just how long the timers are for interacting with things without AI crewmates with the interaction bonus skill. What would normally be around 5 to 10 seconds becomes a 20 second slog trying to open a single door. Don't take AI crewmates for granted, especially in the fallout of the epic merger catastrophe. With controls slipping away rapidly, I took a certified risk on two machines and guard traffic, but was able to hold out long enough for the hacks to finish meaning that even my bungled attempt to escape quietly didn't really matter too much in the end. It was time to head back to the bank heist, though with the vault in the back this time, I decided to take this one quietly, but one ill-timed alert of a guard scuppered that plan pretty quickly. I then went down once again at the hands of Bald Bulldozer, but once again, Fane Death proved to be my saviour. Simply put, trying to remain close quarters with them and stun them reliably was not going to work. Despite the scare, this was a fairly routine mission, and I escaped with my money bag once the assault died down. Next was a trip down to Florida with Counterfeit, where I could once again employ my silent recruitment of a Bronco Cop during the stealth section. His powerful revolver proved crucial as backup for this one, as I resorted to two tapping these shields doing a conga line in this alleyway, grabbing the printing plates, and making a break for it in the sewers. The next one was a bit of a risky one, a re-rolled San Martin bank. I guess we're taking the fight to mask muscle from the SNES punch out on this one. With the increased interaction time and the painful loud objectives, the hope would be that it would be stealth to some degree, and I was able to silently make it to the wire cutting objective. One of them was pretty easy enough to get to, but the game decided to throw a sick sense of humor my way and gave me this one right in an employee lounge where I promptly got spotted. Despite my best efforts to save the situation, I went down to the high-powered Federales and, this time, Fane Death decided that it wouldn't be worth to bring me back for a second wind. With a heist like this, probably for the best. With the world's fastest reroll on the cards, I was brought back to Car Shop, which went pretty much the same way as the first. Manager found, computer hacked, C4 planted, car stolen. No worries there. Then, another re-roll brought me back to Counterfeit, so I was getting pretty lucky with re-rolls right now. Once again, this went the same way as the first run, slogging my way through the heist with my Bronco Cop buddy by my side. Another successful rendition of Counterfeit was down, but at this point, all enemies were starting to hurt badly, so I'd need to pick my battles carefully from here on out. The next heist on the world circuit was the Diamond, in which I got sloppily spotted pretty early on outside. Not a good start. Then, as I attempted to salvage things, I got caught again by this guard in the stairwell, and since I only had one body bag, this made things a race against time until I was spotted. In spite of the awful situation I found myself in, I was able to brute force my way through to the end of the second time lock before I got spotted fully without a pager to spare. But by this point, the hardest part of the heist was done, so even though the game tried to throw a curveball with the puzzle route, I was able to make my way across, grab the diamond, and survive long enough to secure it and escape. It was time once again to take another risk, with breaking feds, one that caused quite the issue or two when I got it on the Belmont run. With the mother of all chain reactions going on when I was forced to hack from the kitchen, I should have really anticipated just how this run was going to go. And despite my best efforts to salvage the situation, a fifth guard spotted the carnage I was leaving behind and doomed the break in Fed's run. 
this heist is just straight up cursed. Quickly nobbing my way out of there with another reroll, it was time to take just as big a risk on one stock remaining with Aftershock. With LA in as big of a wreck as Super Macho Man's face after Mr. Sandman's bout with him, I found the trucks fairly easily, but then the game decided to make things infinitely harder and dropped snipers around the map for me to avoid. This turned what would otherwise be a routine mission into a giant game of cat and mouse, with me going down to a bulldozer yet again and being saved by Fane Death once more. But for the amount of grace resembling King Hippo more than Don Flamenco at this point, I had to worm my way through sniper fire in the truck before having to go on a wild goose chase with the cops to try and survive the best I could with the situation before me. Which I felt was necessary after I got surrounded and sniped before Fane Death saved my skin again. As if death itself was rooting for the underdog here, I was inspired to push to the truck and avoid the snipers waiting for me to clutch victory once again. That may well have been the most tense run I've ever had to deal with, even counting DSOD too. Rerolling once again brought me to a second run of the diamond, and it was here that this god broke all manners of protocol and fired his gun relentlessly on me to break stealth early on. This run showed just how powerful the enemies were getting, with each hit they got on me without a proper build or plan of attack to mitigate it beyond just punching the problem to death. I'm pretty sure desperation started to kick in when I decided to try and throw bags everywhere in the slim hope that doing so would lobotomize some of the attackers. With a hard pressed attack, I was able to make it all the way to the second time lock and hunkered down for what would ultimately be Max last stand. I eventually went down to my constant nemesis, Bald Bulldozer, and the MVP that was Fane Death ultimately had worn itself out, and could not help this run continue any further. With that, the Little Mac run comes to an end at a crime spree rank of 93. Considering that I was handicapped by not having AI crewmates to back me up on top of having nothing but boxing gloves to defend myself with, that's pretty commendable, but it could have been improved on if given the chance. It should go without saying that this is, for all intents and purposes, a joke build. Although it's pretty exhilarating to beat up cops with boxing gloves back to back like a beat em up game, but there's only so much you can do with just lefty and righty. But that's going to do it for this run. Let me know which character you think I should translate to the Payday formula. I definitely look forward to translating this format into Payday 3, assuming the game's structure will lend itself well to that sort of thing. But we'll deal with that then. In the meantime, throw us a like if you enjoyed, subscribe for more content, and I'll see you on whatever I do next. Take care now!